All right, chapter eight, the biology of infectious disease. 8.1, bacteria and viruses. So we're gonna go, we're gonna start off by um, just defining a couple of terms. So starting off with microbes. Microbes are microscopic organisms like bacteria, viruses, protuses. These are gonna be widely distributed in the environment on inan inanimate objects and on living things. Many are actually very useful to humans. Bacteria contribute to the production of yogurt, cheese, bread, beer, wine, pickled foods. Drugs are produced by bacteria. We have harvested so many drugs from bacteria. Um, without the activity of decomposers, the biosphere wouldn't exist. We rely heavily on bacteria in our own gut to produce many of the vitamins and nutrients that we need and cannot get from our diet or synthesize ourselves. Um, so bacteria, microbes are hugely important, hugely, hugely important. However, um, if they are not helpful, if they are causing disease, we refer to them as pathogens. Pathogens are pretty much any disease causing agent that could be uh, bacteria, viruses, and others. Um, but we do have some defenses against pathogens. So we have things like general barriers to prevent pathogens from entering the body, like that skin and mucous membranes. Uh, we can also use phagocytic white blood cells to fight infection after a pathogen gets past the barriers and into the body. And then we'll use our acquired defenses to kill pathogens and protect against cancer. So we do have some protections against these pathogens. But I think one of the most important things that we can uh, talk about in this section is to talk about some of the differences in the physiology and the uh, structure and anatomy of bacteria versus eukaryotic cells. Now, I know we've already talked about <clears throat> eukaryotic cells, and we've talked about the structure, and we've talked about all the nucleus and all of the organelles, but I want to spend a little bit of time focusing on bacterial cells. So bacteria are single-celled prokaryotic organisms. Does anybody remember what prokaryotic means? Hopefully, you stated that prokaryotic means that they do not have a membrane-bound organelle. Oh, I'm sorry, they do not have a membrane-bound nucleus or any other membrane-bound organelles. Um, and they're going to be relatively simple in structure, very small, um, but they do have a couple of key characteristics that I want to talk about. Uh, they come in one of three most common shapes. That would be the coccus, which is sphere-shaped, bacillus, which is rod-shaped, um, spirillum, which is a curved, sometimes spiral-shaped um, bacteria cell. Most of these are going to have a cell wall in addition to the plasma membrane. Now, do you remember um, what we do? Well, here, let me start off with this. Do animal cells, do human cells have a cell wall? We do not. We also do not have any structural carbohydrates. Um, that we use to help maintain like our cell membranes or anything like that. Bacteria, on the other hand, have um, a, a structural carbohydrate. Do you remember when we talked about way on back in chapter two, I believe it was, when we talked about um, the different biomolecules and we talked about structural versus energy storage um, carbohydrates? If you can think back to then, we did cover what um, structural carbohydrate is used by bacteria, and that would be peptidoglycan. Peptidoglycan is a disaccharide with an amino group attached. Now, here's the interesting thing. Uh, some antibiotics, such as penicillin, for example, interfere with the production of the cell wall. Without without the cell wall, that bacteria is suddenly hugely susceptible to our own body's natural defenses. And so I think it's very important that we spend just a little bit of time going over the difference, differences and similarities between prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. So many antibiotics and antifungals work by exploiting those differences. So it's important that you understand them. It's important that you understand how antibiotics work um, because antibiotics can be highly, highly selective in the sense that they will attack any bacterial cell. Now, here's the thing with penicillin. Like I said, it attacks the ability for bacteria to make a cell wall, but your own natural fauna, your own natural flora, your own natural bacteria that's residing in your gut does have its own cell wall. And so unfortunately, if what we are doing is preventing the buildup of cell walls around around um, prokaryotic bacteria. While yes, it makes um, 
it makes foreign invaders susceptible to our immune system, it's also going to make our own bacteria susceptible to our immune system. So it's important to note how these antibiotics work and why um, many of them can lead to um, uh, just damaging your own flora, your own uh, microbiota. So, um, like, so some cells have that cell wall, or they all have that cell wall um, made out of peptidoglycan. Some have an additional capsule. Um, that capsule allows the bacteria, it's a sort of a sticky capsule, it allows that bacteria to stick to surfaces and it helps protect them. Bacteria are going to be classified by the differences in their cell walls, which are, excuse me, detected by using a gram stain. So you may hear of some cells being, or some bacteria being gram positive or gram negative. That simply means whether or not they'll they can be stained by using a gram stain. If there is a peptidoglycan, if the cell walls have a thick layer of peptidoglycan, they'll stain purple with a gram stain. Those will be called gram positive bacteria. If there's no peptidoglycan layer, um, the cells will stain pink and they'll be considered gram negative. These bacteria have an outer membrane with uh, lipos lipopolysaccharides which are going to be released when the cells are killed by the immune system, which can stimulate inflammation and fever in the body. So we're gonna review just some of that basic uh, bacterial structure. The cell envelope is gonna be the outermost layer of the cell, and it's going to include a couple of key characteristics. One would be the plasma membrane. That plasma membrane is gonna be just like the plasma membrane inside of our cells. It's gonna be a lipid bilayer with embedded and peripheral proteins. Next up, so that's this uh, cell membrane right here. Next up, we have the cell wall. As we already mentioned, the cell wall is made up of a structural carbohydrate known as peptidoglycan. This is going to help maintain the shape of this maintain the shape of the cell and give it some layer of strength and protection. The outermost layer is going to also be a layer of polysaccharides. This will be the capsule layer. Inside of that, we're going to have the cytoplasm. The cytoplasm is going to look a lot like our cytoplasm. It's going to be a semi-fluid solution encased by a plasma membrane. It's going to contain water, inorganic, and organic molecules, and enzymes. It's also going to be um, embedded with ribosomes, which will be the site of protein synthesis for this bacteria. Now, the interesting thing about bacteria, although they do not have a membrane-bound nucleus, they still have DNA. So they're going to have what is known as a nucleoid region. That nucleoid region is going to be just the region that contains a single circular DNA molecule. Now, I know this doesn't look like a circle, but this DNA is very, very, very long, many times the length of its own cell. So it's going to be all wound around inside, but it's just one great big long uh, chromosome, one long circular DNA molecule. Inside the cell, now although we only have one chromosome for this bacteria, we do have what is known as a plasmid. Plasmids are going to be small accessory rings of DNA. Now this is going to become very important to us a little bit later when we start talking about biotechnology and bacterial cloning. Um, but what you need to know for now is that this ring of DNA, it's extra chromosomal, so it's not part of the daily function for the, pro uh, for the bacteria, but it may include some very helpful um, bits of DNA, like a code for antibiotic resistance. Often that's going to be coded for inside of a plasmid. That plasmid can be duplicated and passed down or shared um, with other bacteria. So bacteria can pass on their an antibiotic resistance, not only to their offspring, but to other neighboring bacteria. This will become very important later. So I'm just pointing out the plasmid now. The ribosomes, like I said, those are gonna be um, around to synthesize our proteins. We're also going to see some external features um, on our bacterial cell. We're going to see things like a flagella. This is going to provide motility for that bacterial cell. We'll also might see things like fimbrae. Now, these kind of look a little bit like the cilia that we mentioned in our eukaryotic cells. However, their function is very different. Um, in eukaryotic cells, cilia beat back and forth, back and forth, and they help move um, either the cell itself or move the fluid past the cell. In the case of a bacteria, these fimbrae are like small bristle-like fibers. They're bristle-like projections. You can kind of think of it as Velcro. They help the bacteria adhere to surfaces. There is also going to be um, a conjugation pili. This is a rigid tubular structure that's used to pass DNA in the form of pl plasmids back and forth with other cells.
Another important thing that I want to talk about with our bacterial cells is how they reproduce. They're going to reproduce with, through a process known as binary fission. This is when we're going to see um, the cell is actually going to reproduce asexually, meaning that it's simply going to clone itself and divide. So what happens is that initial um, circular chromosome that's going, is, that is attached to the plasma membrane is going to be copied. Then the chromosomes are going to separate as the cell enlarges and the cell is just basically going to grow and grow and grow until it's able to separate into two cells. Now these can reproduce very rapidly under favorable conditions. Some bacteria are able to double their numbers every 20 minutes. Um, strep throat, tuberculosis, gangrene, gonorrhea, syphilis, they're all well-known bacterial diseases. Not only does the growth of bacteria cause disease, but some bacteria can release toxins that inhibit cellular metabolism. So just as an example, the tetanus shot protects against the Clostridium tetani, which produces a toxin that could prevent the relaxation of muscles. In time, all of your muscles will contract, which could ultimately lead to suffocation. If your diaphragm contracts, it is a muscle. If it contracts for too long, your uh, lungs won't be able to respire. You won't be able to breathe in and out, um, which could lead to suffocation. Viruses. So I do want to talk just a little bit about viruses. We've mentioned bacteria. We're going to move on to viruses. Viruses are very, very, very small. Like bacteria are small, but viruses are very small. And the reason for this is that they are actually non-living. They're acellular. They do not have a cell. Um, they cannot carry out the functions of life on their own. Um, they must reproduce inside of a host cell. So they have to infect a host in order to reproduce and survive. Now they're going to be made up of two parts. There's an outer protein coat called a capsid. And inside of that is going to be um, their instructions for how to be a virus. Uh, it'll be a nucleic acid either DNA or RNA inside. Now the interesting thing is, is what they do is they carry the genetic information that they need to reproduce. So other cellular organisms, viral genetic material can be either, or in contrast to other cellular organisms, viral genetic material can be either DNA or RNA. They don't need a full set of DNA necessarily to reproduce. Now here's the thing, is that these um, Viruses, although they are non-living themselves, they are parasites. They're tiny little cellular parasites. They commandeer the metabolic machinery of a host cell and they utilize that cell to produce as many copies of it as they can. Once they produce sort of a sufficient amount, they can actually burst the cell and release and infect. And those little viruses can then infect all of the other cells around it. They can spread and replicate very rapidly. So I want to show you just a little bit to give you a size comparison. Here's a eukaryotic cell compared to a bacteria cell. This is how macrophages, these white blood cells, are able to ingest and engulf bacterial cells. It's because they're relatively small in comparison. Here we have um, a eukaryotic cell, and you can see right over here we have a cell undergoing um, phagocytosis. So it's ingesting a little particle right there. It would not take much to ingest um, a bacterial cell, a prokaryotic periodic bacterial cell beyond that. Viruses, on the other hand, are even smaller. I mean, they are very tiny compared to uh, eukaryotic cells, but all it really takes is one. It takes one to infect the surface, inject its DNA, and then uh, start replicating. So there are, like I said, there are two parts to a virus. There's the capsid, which is going to be this sort of protein outer shell, and then inside the DNA is going to be housed. This carries the genetic information needed to reproduce. Um, portions of the virus can bind to the receptor on the, host of, on the host cell's surface. Once the virus attaches, its DNA or RNA, whatever it's using, can then enter the cell and code for the proteins that are formed in the capsid. Once it makes the proteins for the capsid, it can replicate its DNA, fill those up, and send those suckers off to infect more cells. The last thing I want to mention are prions, which are infectious protein particles. Um, they can cause degenerative diseases of the nervous system. So they are simply um, normal forms of the protein folded into abnormal shapes called prions. Now the problem with prions is that they are actually able to change the shape of other proteins. So these misfolded proteins can pass on that misfolded protein and um, lead to a whole host of diseases. All right, and that's it for this section.